The player season reviews continue today. Caitlin and I take a deep dive into the rookie season of Benedict Matherin, the good, the bad, where he needs to grow, his fit with Halburn, and why I am personally very bullish on Benedict Matherin's future. It's all coming today on the Locked On Pacers podcast. You are Locked On Pacers, your daily Indiana Pacers podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Welcome in to another edition of the Locked On Pacers podcast, where we, of course, talk about the Indiana Pacers, as always. My name's Tony East. I cover the team for Forbes and SI, and today, diving into the player season reviews again with Caitlin Cooper. So much fun doing these. Her insight is, is just unbelievable, and today... We're diving into rookie guard Benedict Matherin. The one, we're doing the one again, a one over under one stat, one clip that tells all about his season, what he needs to work on going forward, his fit on this team, all sorts of stuff for Matherin's rookie season. Again, to support Caitlin, patreon.com backslash basketball, she wrote, is where you can find all of her incredible work and her write-ups of all these player season reviews that we're doing. I highly recommend you check that out. Now let's dive right in to Benedict Matherin's first season. Back again for day two of Pacers player season reviews slash recaps. If you missed yesterday's with the backup big men, go check it out to get the, the vibe of what we're doing here. Caitlin Cooper from Basketball She Wrote on her Patreon is here again. And we're doing this in the style of what they used to do with Mark Schindler on Indie Corners called The One. One stat, one clip, one over under in an order TBD to review player seasons. And today, deep dive on Benedict Matherin, who had, I don't even know what the right word to call his season, an excellent first month and a half, a wobbly middle part, a very fascinating ending. We have a lot to get to. Caitlin, what was your favorite part, before we get to this, of Ben Matherin's season? I think my favorite part was probably the very first win of the season over the Pistons. Like, that's going to sound crazy, but, like, he made some isolation threes in that game, and his whole time at Arizona, he only attempted, like, a handful of those, and I remember tweeting that night, like, I don't know what to make of Benedict Matherin right now. Like, the scoring binges he was going on and some of the stuff that he was doing wasn't necessarily what I projected or thought of him that he would show as early as he did in addition to all the foul drawing. The game against Denver also stands out where he had however many points in the second quarter, and that was like that tidal wave. They ended up losing the game in the end, but the second quarter with him leading the bench unit was really good. But what is your favorite Benedict Matherin moment? Mine was also fairly early in the season uh, when they beat Miami at home. And he had 12 free throw attempts. And I thought that was the first game that I was like, man, this guy might might have something that rookies don't have because 12 free throw attempts for a rookie is crazy. His free throw rate all season was crazy. But that was the first time where he wasn't even like that good scoring the ball that game. But if you can get to the line 12 times, your efficiency is going to look great no matter what. That actually had one of my favorite screenshots of the season in it because he gathered the ball from outside the free throw line. And there were four Miami Heat players with at least one foot in the lane. And he had an and one at the rim, which, I mean, speaks to kind of what his process can be in some of those situations, but also his <laughs> body control and weaving through lanes and like just how good he is in transition to it, being able to decelerate around the rim and drag his toe and alternate stride lengths to really lose guys. Like, I think that's probably some of the most standout things. His first step is very deceptive as well. So we'll get into all this though. We're going to get into everything. <laughs> this wasn't even happened. part of the program. This was it wasn't. <laughs> just, just going off topic. But unfortunately, the clip that I picked, I kind of went on this one with a trend more because Benedict entering his second season, I looked more for improvement areas, I would guess I would say, more than plays that necessarily – like define the type of player that he was. If you want that, go look back at the Miami Heat play that I just described. But instead, I'm going to take us to a uh, earlier season Nick game. And this is kind of like a giant display of dissociative defense from everybody that's on the floor. But um, <laughs> Isaiah Hartenstein setting a screen for Emmanuel quickly. And this is a rare instance before Benedict joined the starting lineup where he's actually defending at the point of attack. So he is guarding Emmanuel quickly and Isaiah Jackson kind of has to snap into attention. He's not really ready to grab to guard, but it appears as though he intended to be in drop, which means that Benedict needed to be 
going over the screen. But as he has a tendency to do with his screen navigation, sometimes he gets caught between going over or ducking under. Sometimes when he starts to get clipped by a screen, he just hugs the big and then kind of leaves his own teammate being the big, in this case, Isaiah Jackson, to kind of clean up the mess. And I'm not exactly sure why Emmanuel quickly just didn't go into a pull-up three there. He must have thought Isaiah Jackson would be able to close on the space. But anyways, Matherin gets caught on the screen from Hartenstein. Isaiah Jackson takes quickly. And if you just watch this clip at first blush, most people looking at it are probably going to assume that Jalen Smith on the wing just totally forgets that Obi Toppin exists, but the Pacers scheme in most instances, if they switch a ball screen, the opposite big is supposed to scram or kick out, switch that guy on the roll. So Jalen's sinking into the lane to take Isaiah Hartenstein with Matherin now switched on to him. And Matherin doesn't necessarily have the reaction speed to get back out and peel off to Toppin on the wing. So Toppin gets a wide open three. So I just felt like this possession in and of itself kind of showcases both where he needs to grow on defense in terms of if he's going to be at the point of attack, depending upon who else is in the starting lineup next year, the screen navigation has to get better. And then also as an off ball defender, a lot of times you can see where a guy's processing speed is when you're in a scramble situation or you're having to rotate. And sometimes he can just be, you know, a beat too slow recognizing where his next rotation needs to be. Where are you at with the Benedict Matherin defense experience? Yeah. And this clip is like, he gets to the foul line basically and hard sides right behind him, but he's looking at quickly. Like he's still looking at the ball. Not even the guy, if he was just switching the pick and roll that he'd be covering, like a pass could have just gone over his head and top is just wide open uh, all season. I think I kind of had the same opinion of his defense and like, this clip, kind of, what I just said, kind of goes back to it. Is like he he can defend the ball well-ish. Like he's got quick feet and can stand in front of guys, and he tries really hard and is a pass. But his team defense, his where is everybody, his pattern recognition kind of stuff, and like, look, no rookie is good at this thing, right? Or very rarely, I should say. But very, but he just his team defense needs a ton of work still to know what he's supposed to be doing, what the coverage is, what's behind him, what's in front of him, where do I stand, how do I turn? Like that kind of stuff was really poor. And and in this situation too, like a big part of the Pacers' problem this year was bad closeouts and getting blown by. And like it had Toppin just faked this three and drove, he would have got right by Matherin because he's closing out so hard because he's so far away. Like it all kind of comes back to the same stuff. So when he's physically guarding the person dribbling, I think he's okay on defense, especially for a rookie. Everywhere else, I kind of think he's got a lot of growing to do. Yeah, I think one of the best moments in terms of him guarding the ball was when he and Andrew Nemhard both against the one game in Miami where they did uh, peel switching from the corner. So Andrew Nemhard got beat on a closeout. That means that Benedict will slide over from the corner, take the guy who gets beat, and Andrew will then recover to the corner. So it's a peel switch in that way. Benedict was kind of okay in those types of situations, but a lot of times he's just flat footed and not completely ready to guard. So even in the season finale, when Rick took him out, when he got beat by Emmanuel quickly, he gave up a middle drive and quickly got right to the rim and Rick took him out momentarily, talked to him about it and then put him back in. And like, I'm sure you guys probably talked to him after games. It seemed like there was much more of an emphasis once he got put into the starting lineup to be getting assigned to tougher assignments. Yep. He, when they were up in Toronto, like I think in part when they were in Toronto, it went to the, uh, the fact that they wanted to start O'Shea Brissett in that game. So because O'Shea was starting instead of Nemhard and Neesmith, like normally in that game, Neesmith would have taken Pascal Siakam. Nemhard would have taken Fred Van Fleet, but because O'Shea was out there, they put Nemhard on Pascal Siakam and they allowed Matherin to guard Fred Van Fleet and like very Fred Van Vliet, I should say, with a V, not an F. But um very early in that game, it became clear that like the screen navigation for him against Fred, like Fred didn't shoot the ball well, but he was getting into the paint and that was making it easier for Pirtle on those pocket passes to be getting loose like he was until finally at the end of the game. They ended up telling Neesmith, you're guarding Pirtle now. We're moving Miles off the ball because we got to switch the ball screens again. And like you said, like rookies normally do have struggles on this end of the floor defensively, but then it stands out like that almost makes what Nemhard does more impressive because yeah. Nemhard is such a strong team defender and he makes – like we always think about reads on the offensive end of the floor. We don't always think about them on the defensive end of the floor. And Nemhard makes a lot of defensive reads within a team scheme where he can jump across multiple assignments on the same possession. And that's just not 
there yet for Matherin. Cause like, I don't, I can't, to be honest, I can't name specific things on defense other than some of the athletic plays he makes with like chase down blocks where I can say that's a strength for him right now or not an area where he needs to improve. Yeah. Matherin would benefit a lot from Dan Burke. If Dan Burke was still on the Pacers bench, just because of like every player I talked about what Dan Burke helped them with defensively was those little things like, Hey, instead of standing here, turn your body like this a little bit and stand over here a little bit, right? Like stuff that I wouldn't understand. And I just described it like a five-year-old, but like that really helps a lot of players. I think Matherin would benefit a ton from that and on the ball too. You, you can be a little better there. I think just because he's kind of burlesque and speedy with his feet, he doesn't look as bad there. And those late season moments where they were like, Oh, you know what? Donovan Mitchell tonight or whoever Shea or whoever, like those will help him. And he was fine enough doing that. Uh, but the, t- the, the general zoom out, this is five players all needing to be connected scheme. Here's what we're doing. Here's how we're stopping this. And here's what we're doing. If they do this. And if they do this, do this like that is where he has a long way to go. And yes, Nembard, the juxtaposition is huge. Like now Andrew Nembard's basically one of those like wacky waving like tube things where the air goes up and they blow up and their arms are going everywhere. Like Nembard doesn't get tired. His arms just keep moving forever. And Mather and Drew down in his side because it's exhausting to do that. And he's, you know, it's hard. And, and I think that is where defensively and really in general, like he's talked about a lot that for him personally in his conversations with Rick, he wants to be a great elite, best in the league two way player while well, he's got to grow on defense to be that guy. Yeah. Cause I mean, you can point to certain games throughout the year where it was like that game against Miami where he only played 13 minutes and within like a five minute span in the first quarter, like he's, it's not even necessarily always like, very technical defensive things it's like okay i just got beat in transition i already was flipped and ready to give jimmy butler his left even though a screen wasn't coming and i was in ice coverage when that wasn't even communicated to me and now i've given up a straight drive left hand drive right to the rim so you know maybe some of that goes down to learning coverages and stuff but like you know it's tough like i said because when he's chasing over a screen he has problems and if you're going to use him in switch like when they assigned him to trey young when they were at atlanta then when he switches off he he has similar problems impacting passes to the roller so it just makes things a little bit difficult i'm sure we'll talk about his fit with tyrese on the offensive end of the floor as well but until Tyrese can make some strides on that end of the floor, if they're both in the starting lineup, I don't really feel good about assigning either one of them to point of attack options um, with the way that Tyrese especially was being hunted down the stretch. Um, it makes it difficult to know which types of people you can put them on. So It's tough. Tyrese is a good team defender. He's got those recognition things you mentioned, but his on-ball defense was not particularly good, so... Yeah, they're both. If they're going to start together, even beyond their offensive fit and the whole, sorry to use this phrase, the one ball stuff, <laughs> you know, they're going to have to figure out a lot of stuff in terms of fit. Hey guys, one short little break so I can talk to you about Nissan. And before we talk about the Nissan Aria, the 2023 all electric vehicle, we got to name Nissan's most electric player of the week. And Matherin hasn't played this week, or else he would be the obvious choice. So we will go with an ex Pacer who's playing well. As of me talking right now, and that's Malcolm Brogdon, who Celtics are again, as I'm speaking, up 2-0, uh, when he just had a brilliant game two and a win over the Hawks. 13 points, 7 rebounds, 8 assists, plus a billion as the Celtics go up 2-0 on the Hawks in that series. He was electric, brilliantly fierce, fiercely elegant, stunningly powerful, and elegantly powerful in the Celtics game two win. And like the Nissan Aria, he delivered on duality. A combination of fierceness and elegance, beautiful but strong, the perfect SUV crossover. The 2023 Nissan Aria packs penny to your seat power and premium intelligence all in one electric vehicle. The all new all electric 2023 Nissan Aria, the electric vehicle for people who love to drive. Shop now at NissanUSA.com. Okay, so I guess I just wanted to get your overall thoughts before we head into the one number about how did you feel or what what was your exit survey on Benedict Mather and entering the starting lineup? Um, did you see any significant strides that you think he can carry over into next season or or any negatives that you noticed that you didn't think he was quite ready for? Like, how do you evaluate him in the present future? That was a column that I wrote uh, about a week ago. I think a big part of it for me was the the phrase that Rick kept using was responsibilities. He has different responsibilities. The stuff he's 
maybe not being asked to do, but the stuff he has opportunities to do are one different than normal when he's coming off the bench and two more challenging, whether that's guarding a better player or in his case, something he talked about sometimes this season is like, and every player talks about this to some extent, but for rookies, it can be extra beneficial. If you come off the bench, you see the first, however many minutes of the game, and you can see the defense's coverage for whatever the Pacers are doing in terms of, you know, what, what their pick and roll coverage is, how they're defending this thing you do off the ball. And Mather, it's pretty slippery away from the play. Like when you're starting, you have to figure it out while you're out there, while you're playing, read and react. And I think that was something I thought he did pretty well is adjusting to what the defense was, was throwing at him when he started. He had more reps to kind of play, make a little bit six assists in their last game season. I, I mean, I'm just throwing round numbers out there at this point, but like, a little bit better at the passing stuff. He's got a long way to go there still, but last three games looked, looked a little bit better distributing. Like there were things that he did that he wasn't asked to do as much during the season. I thought, okay, that's good that he's exploring this and that it doesn't look totally unnatural and impossible, but at the same time, still steps to go defensively. Like they, we talked about this on the big man show yesterday, but like their defensive rating in these games was so high that I thought you were lying. Like, you know, the, the strides to go on that end of the floor, still creator strides to go. It's not like he was running pick and rolls or anything like that. Uh, and still some shot in general decision-making strides to go. But I, I, in general was, you know, I took away positives from that, just that he was doing different stuff and looked somewhat natural and, and growth mindseted in those moments. That was not a word, but I hope you know what I meant. Yeah, I think you brought up good things there because it wasn't even just that, you know, when he was coming off the bench, you're obviously being guarded by bench players. When you go into the starting lineup, you're being guarded by a starter. And it wasn't even just, you know, any starter. When Tyrese isn't out on the floor, a lot of times he was drawing the best defensive assignment. So, like, right. they're in Toronto, and Will Barton was guarding Andrew Nemhard when Andrew Nemhard went off in that first quarter. And that's not to take anything away from Andrew. Like, he made very good reads and and slalom to his spots and showed a lot of guile in that game and in front of the home Canadian fans for him. But it was Matherin who's, you know, seeing – and Buddy who were seeing OG on an OB and, you know, the other – Fred Van Fleet was guarding Matherin in that particular game. Same thing against the Knicks. When, when Tyrese Halliburton was healthy – he was being guarded by Quentin Grimes and, you know, being kind of harassed by what their drop coverage can be with Mitchell Robinson to the point where, you know, they ended up trying to pick on Julius Randle at the end of that game, even though Julius Randle, you know, can actually move his feet pretty well in space because of what Grimes have been doing. At the end of the season, they didn't put Grimes on Andrew Nemhard in those games. They put Grimes on Benedict Matherin. So that was a growth curve for him. And I think that was good to get him those reps at the back end of the season and allow everybody to see what he could do. And you could also see spots where they were like, trying to give him training reels to us, so to speak. And I hope people don't take that the wrong way. I think it was a good thing where, you know, they ran plays. I think they call it early where he would kind of get like, I wouldn't necessarily call it a post up, but right inside the wing and outside the elbow, they were getting him touches and what you would think of like the Kobe or the Jordan spot where they wanted him to be able to create his own shot very quickly. So they were, you know, giving him the ball and seeing if he can get off that Island and do something, which that wasn't a play they were running before he came back from that injury. And I think that was a little bit of a mixed bag. Sometimes it led to step back twos, which I think they were willing to accept because if he can do it at that spot, then they can eventually, you know, push him out to three and hope that he can get it from those areas as well in creating his own shot. And there were strides at times because earlier in the year, like the main way that I think it's better for Matherin is what you said that like playing out of handoffs where he can have his defender trailing is typically better for him than against the switch. So one thing that happened on like that seven game road trip is teams started switching up the line on those handoffs. So those, those plays that we talked about with Daniel Tice on the prior episode, where there's a screen in the middle of a handoff, they'd switch it to kind of cauterize what his ability to get downhill was by the end of the year, when they were in Toronto, the Raptors did that with Jakob Pertl and he made a three against it. So there were little strides and little things that I think you could see down the stretch where he did things better. I like that you brought up the passing. Cause like, I don't think all of it was perfect, but he was making like short, easy passes to the corner. If somebody came and hopped off the corner yes. and he was more recognizing of that. So that kind of goes right into my first number and I'll let you play off of what you want to say there. So my first number is actually 26 and that was his pass percentage on drives after being inserted into the starting lineup over the last 11 games of the season. Prior to that and what the number was for the season was 18.1%, which ranked 139th among the 142 players who averaged at least five drives per game. So 26% still isn't a robust number, 
but he was making passes more often out of drives as a starter and with, you know, more responsibility than what he had been doing earlier in the season. If we covered the whole league, I would have a ball trying to guess the four players below that 18.8% number. I don't know if you have that list in front of you still. I do. I do. I think it was Joel Embiid, Kelly Oubre, and I don't remember who the other person was. But An yeah. MVP, uh, a guy on Tony's all top five least favorite guys to watch in the league team, and I forget <laughs> who the third one is. Yeah, I can't remember who the third one is. <laughs> yeah, that is something – I don't remember when I said it on this show this season, but like being able to see the low man and kick to the corner is a very simple pass that helps so much with a player like him who – is attacking downhill a lot and makes plays in the lane and draws fouls and finishes like that. Just even if it's a quarter of a second where that defender has to think about what they're about to do, whether that's step up to you or stay where they are, that is such an advantage to what it allows him to do between making decisions or having a, a an easier lane to the basket. And that's why those simple passes were so significant to see a little bit more happening down the stretch of the season. And obviously they made a bajillion threes and that's why his assist number was high against the Knicks. But like that is progress for him in a way that was not there for a lot of the season. Like when we went to Cleveland to watch them, I was actually thinking maybe I'll do a story on Donovan Mitchell and in his first year and Matherin, can he copy some of that growth path? Not that they're comparable players, but just mm -hmm. in general. But the big difference for between them was passing. Like even right away, Mitchell was a four assists per game kind of guy. He could hit open men and and make some pick and roll stuff. And Matherin hadn't done that. And there again, there weren't a lot of pick and rolls, but there were better passes down the stretch. And that was probably my most encouraging takeaway from that stretch. And to tie it into the drives, the fact that it's coming in perhaps his best situation when he has an advantage or is asked to create one with the ball is significant for what he can be going forward. Yeah, because the last possession of the game against the Heat when he only played third 13 minutes, his final offensive possession, they ran a play for him. The guy came off the ball side corner. He didn't make the kick out. And then he saw a crowd and that can kind of be the thing for him where just because a play is run for you doesn't necessarily mean the shot has to be for you. And it kind of reminded me a little bit of, you know, TJ Warren in the 1920 season. Like, yes, the Pacers needed him to be a scorer, but his pass out rate on drives that season was 21.4%. And there was times where it was just like, okay, he's going to score no matter what even if that isn't necessarily what the best play is in that situation. And like, I like what you bring up about the low man, because a lot of times when he is in like secondary pick and rolls, it will be with an empty side so that he's not having to read that backside defender. But there were a few times like he found Jalen Smith. I want to say, um, what was it? The game, the maybe the first game against the Knicks, where he did have to read that backside tagger, and and yep. he made a quick. That was his only assist that game, I think. Or and one he of made, his yeah, he yeah. made that. He made that and saw that read that was there. So that was a good. Um, I think one of the places that he still struggles when he sees help coverage is with dig downs from the wing. That's kind of where when he sees that stunt, he still kind of wants to treat it like a turnstile and just blow through it where either with his handle or with the pass, he's going to have to get better at keeping that at bay. Um, which that might come with time, but some of it comes from the fact that like, I think when I looked up at synergy this morning, 57% of his drives are to the left. And that comes to how deceptive his first step is and how much he wants to use the jab step. Like in the article I wrote earlier this season, like he wants to jab to the right to shift that defender. And then he puts the ball on the floor with his left. And you can tell that the Pacers are aware of how much he wants to do that because one of the most common actions they run for him is called horns get. So he will be at the right, the right horn or the right elbow and then imagine like miles turner at the left elbow they in, input the ball to matherin there and then miles will come across the free throw line to set a ball screen for matherin well when you're doing that it's for matherin to put the ball down with his left and the first game that he came back from injury against the hornets they were standing in the wrong spots so Matherin was on the left elbow, which means when he gets the screen, he'd be putting the ball down on the floor with his right. And Miles screened him out of it so that he could go stand at the other elbow. So he's definitely comfortable with that. But the thing is, is if he's not out of a set play where he's going to get an advantage in that sort of way, like his right to left cross and his handle is still a little bit loose when he gets it to his left in that setting. So he's going to have to tighten that up. I think that showed up. He had more turnovers than assists over the back end. Um, in part because he was kind of losing control of the ball at times and because he was seeing better defenders. So that's something that's going to have to come. But I also wanted to bring up that pass out rate number because somebody who I think is comparable to him, not completely, but in the way that they move and how much they 
you know, put in work before they put the ball on the floor, the shimmy jab, the jab step is Jimmy Butler. So, and they also both don't can pass up some open shots from three at times. So Jimmy's pass out rate has never been below 40%, which I think is important if you're somebody who's more of a catch and drive rather than a catch and shoot player. So I think that Benedict's either going to have to become more natural at being willing to shoot when he is open or he's going to have to continue to grow what the pass out rate is. Because as much as we brought up and how much I love that play where he got and got the and one when there was four Miami Heat players with at least one foot in the lane, um, that's going to get more difficult to do if people find out that he's not hitting the open catch and shoot threes. So um, I think that's probably what we're going to talk about next. But where are you at with his shooting and and what some of the catch and shoot stuff was. He, his numbers did pick up a little bit over the last like three games from three, I think. One more break here, guys, so I can talk to you about eBay Motors for a championship team. It's all about making sure every player is a perfect fit. It's the same when it comes to your vehicle. Every part needs to fit just right. So the next time you need parts and accessories, head to eBay Motors. With eBay Guaranteed Fit, you can be sure every part you need fits exactly right the first time around. Just add your ride to my garage and look for the green check to know the part will fit or your money back. Because just like in sports, confidence is the name of the game when you shop on eBay Motors. And with over 122 million parts to choose from, you'll be back in the game in no time. After all, it's easy to bring home a win when the right parts are guaranteed. Get the right parts, the right fit, and the right prices on ebaymotors.com. Let's ride. Eligible items only. Exclusions apply. Sorry, I got to respond to some of that stuff first. Oh, so, sure. Yeah. <laughs> Jimmy is, first of all, a super underrated player, but like the free throw part of his game, I feel like is something Matherin can copy as he grows. But that's one player I would like to see him study and take stuff from. Another one is Jalen Brown. Jalen Brown had a loose handle when he came in the NBA and couldn't really pass and was limited as a scorer. And he he was he's miles ahead of where Brown was as a rookie. Like study if you're Benedict Mather and how Jalen Brown got his handle tighter. Paul George did this too, but Jalen Brown did it more so to me uh, because that would be a, a significant way to help him just with with more things he can do in the lane. Like early in the season, I remember I was talking to Carlisle about how Mather's being defended differently, and they were working on a Euro step because all of a sudden people knew he could score like crazy and draw fouls in the lane. They needed a counter for that. Like if he had a tighter handle. Naturally, you have more counters to make more plays in the lane. Like in general, studying guys who have had looser handles or dribbling ability when they came into the league would be huge for him. And Jalen Brown is one of those. As for shooting, I feel like we're talking about Jalen Smith again because early season, it was awesome, right? Like great catch and shoot guy. When he won rookie of the month for those first two months, he was at like 40% for almost 20, 25 games to start the season, right? And then it just torpedoed after that. And uh, it's hard, you know, you have to use the full season sample to say. So it's like, did he, the team start to realize he's a better shooter and they didn't have any film at first? Or uh, was he just unusually hot? Like, where does it, where does that fall? I don't have his actual catch and shoot numbers in front of me off the top of my head. They'd be higher than his off the dribble percentage, like everyone ever. So I, you know, I think that he is probably a better shooter than the numbers maybe bear out. Like he's willing to take them. His technique is fine but if you know if you're only a 30 percent guy that also is going to make it harder for you to be good at the stuff you're good at so uh i it's hard to say because he started so hot exactly where that's all going to land here's something that i find interesting now about my own eval last year whenever i was doing draft coverage of him that i now look at in a slightly different light when i wrote that article i pointed out that he was shooting 38 percent on shots coming off of screens which are more difficult shots and 26% on unguarded catch and shoots. And that was according to Synergy from his sophomore season at Arizona. I was like, you know, he had a little bit of a down shooting year in his second year, but that could be noisy. And it might actually be that he's a better shooter than what those numbers represent because he was missing open shots. But now like that kind of continued this year. When you look at the numbers this year. Oh, wow. I found um, it. Wow. Go ahead. Sorry. (laughs) Yeah. So, yeah, he shot 33% on unguarded catch and shoots, according to Synergy. So not as bad as what was the case at Arizona, but he's still missing open catch and shoots and shot pretty well off of screens, which that's not all threes. But I think some of what the discrepancy comes from there is like when he was at Arizona, they were running very specific plays to get him those catch and shoot threes coming off of screens. Like, you know, we're running an exit screen with a pick and roll. You're going to come off the exit screen. The ball is going to come to you. You know that that is your shot. 
now, like when he's getting some of these catch and shoots within the offense, you can tell from him that his first inclination is to catch and drive. Like even when he is open, he doesn't always take the shot that's there. And you can see over the back end, like he had a moment in the corner against Dallas where he double clutched or he automatically puts the ball on the floor. And what I think over time is you have to wonder if teams are going to adjust to that because of how deceptive his first step will be and go with not as hard of closeouts. And if he's not seeing as hard of closeouts, how is that going to impact his driving game? So the one over, I'm going to let you respond to all that, but the one over under that I picked is 33% because according to Synergy, that was his conversion rate on unguarded catch and shoots this season. And whether you think that he can shoot a better or lower number out of that and what the ramifications of that are. So you can take that any, any way you want to. Yeah, he's interesting in like like the I I started to learn chess, which is a terrible use of my time. I need to stop playing. But there's like part of the game is taking space on the board if you can, right? Like cover more stuff, move forward, take more space if you can. And with Matherin's drives, I view that similarly. Whereas like sometimes if he catches and he has space, taking that space can be better for his skill set. Right now, you're close to the rim, right? You're better in that space we've seen you get to the foul line like take the space that's fine a lot of players that is the better decision but that might not be there as an option if the shot doesn't materialize or if this percentage doesn't improve uh the nba's site percentages were 30.8 percent on catch and shoot threes and 34.9 percent on pull-ups right like maybe he's just more comfortable doing that I, i i don't know but either way that is something that if especially if he's going to be playing alongside tyrese hubbard who can and should have the ball all the time Right? He's going to have to be better at catch and shoot threes by default. And so if he is left open um, because he can't make them, yeah, I'd maybe say over like he looks natural as a shooter at times. But there is no evidence that that number is over, right? Which is sort of part of the reason that their fit is going to be exceedingly fascinating next season. Because if he can't shoot, like he, even when they were on the floor together, I looked this up before we started, like the Pacers offensive rating was bananas. The team shot well from deep, but it's like, it doesn't feel like it's because of anything those two complement each other on specifically. I'm getting ahead of myself. This isn't what you asked, but you know, 33%. I bet he ends up slightly over that next season, but maybe not too much. There's no historical evidence that suggests he will go flying past that all of a sudden. Yeah. And you have to think somewhat with the pull-ups, some of the ways that he gets those is if he gets a switch against the big, like if people want to go look at one particular clip when they played the Cavs and the Cavs were switching in the fourth quarter midway through the season, like he has a switch against Jarrett Allen. Typically what Benedict will do against a big is he doesn't drive those switches very often. He will pass to the nearest person, then get the ball back, back up a little bit, use the jab step to get the big to respond to his drive, and then he'll he'll pull up and hit the three. So, like, he's allowed to be, you know, wait while he's waiting. Like, he can kind of be a little bit more patient there and still have space to shoot where some of what can be a little bit of glitchiness for him in the catch-and-shoot situations isn't quite there. There's just not a real natural transfer of motion for him always going into the catch and shoot. So I think with Tyrese, like the offensive rating in part is because I think they, if I haven't looked it up on cleaning the glass, but my guess is they get a lot in transition when the two of them are out there because Benedict is such a force in transition and because Tyrese is so good at throwing the hit ahead passes. And that probably gets juiced even more when miles is out there too, because they probably get more stops. Sometimes miles is blocks. Miles is very good at keeping the blocks in bounds and then you can get and run off of those as well. So that's part of it. I mean, I think I still like their fit overall. We didn't, you know, I think that they were slightly positive in their minutes. I think they did outscore opponents because like you said, it was propped up by an otherworldly offensive rating Um, is that you can use Benedict so much to attack closeouts. If he continues to see hard closeouts and in secondary actions, which I think, you know, when Tyrese is one of the best pick and roll creators in the NBA, it's hard to, warrant seeding those types of reps to somebody else on the floor and you don't necessarily have to with benedict like you can run a ball screen for tyrese and then go into veer and one of benedict's best actions this year is veer which is a ball screen into a pin down he's great at curling that making himself dangerous coming around a pin down where he doesn't just have to shoot he can curl it and get all the way to the rim that fits very well with tyrese the chicago action where like tyrese gets it they come set the little touch screen in the corner like we talked about the last episode and Benedict can be in the opposite corner and get that second side and get downhill. That fits pretty well between the two of them. It's 
My bigger concern for them is at the other end of the floor and how they're going to correct that, especially like if you continue to play Andrew Nemhard in the starting lineup, then you can certainly throw him against, you know, opposing team's best assignment. But if you aren't, depending upon how things shake out at the four spot and what other changes they make, they just have a lot of people on this roster, which this is a little bit of a side tangent. But I think you can point to a game, Tony, where almost every player on this roster was targeted. And what's funny is, like, teams are coming up with scouting reports about, like, you know, we're going to attack this guy, we're going to attack this guy, or who it is. And there there really wasn't a wrong answer in a lot of games. Like, you can look at it. Like, they play the Utah Jazz. Colin Sexton's going at Tyrese Halliburton. Shea Gilders Alexander ended up with Benedict Mathern at the end of the game on that switch. Jalen Brunson went at Buddy Heald when they were in Toronto. Like, they went at Wara. The Knicks went at Wara a lot down the stretch with Emmanuel Quickly. Um, sometimes it's even been Miles Turner. Drew Holiday was trying to get switches against Miles Turner when he had the big game against the Pacers. So they just have a lot of options there, and it makes things tougher because if Tyrese is going to get targeted, then you'd like to have a guy that you can, you know, scram or kick him out of some of that because of how much value he adds on the offensive end of the floor. You don't want him to get drained in those situations because he has to have the energy to maintain their pace identity. So um, that's kind of where I am with the two of them, but I guess I never actually answered my over my own over under. <laughs> I think I'm going to be bullish on it and pick the over just because I think if he plays more minutes with Tyrese, if he is the starter next year, there'll be more attention on Tyrese and maybe those shots that are open, he starts to get a little bit more natural. And I'm sure there will be an emphasis from the coaching staff that he needs to um, be making himself a shooter in addition to what he does in attacking the closeouts. But I guess I will ask you that question. Do you think in game one next year that Benedict Mathern will be in the starting lineup? Yeah, you just nailed my natural segue. Like a lot of the questions I would have about how the Pacers are going to handle this crazy offseason is, is their plan right this second to start all three of those guys again, Nembard, Halberd, and Matherin. And if it is, then it's like you have to, have to, have to get something else at the four with, with absolutely no knock on Aaron Smith, who had a great season. Like you need more size and more defensive ability to do those grand things that you just talked about because there's going to be issues with size and defensive abilities with that group, even if you have Turner with them. And if that is, maybe that is the answer. That's fine. Those, those three guys were good and had really awesome seasons, but you're going to need to figure out what that is. And if that's not the plan, who's the guy that's not among that trio that is starting, right? Is Nembard the backup one? Is he the backup two? Is Matherin the backup two? Where does this all come together? I don't think you start Matherin at the end of this last season and give him that experience and give him those added responsibilities to then not do that when next season starts. You know, that's a very, it's only eight games and Halliburton was only playing for two of them right like it, it maybe it means nothing but to me you don't do that and give him that experience and start to grow him in that way unless you're planning on that being something significant next season but uh so that's my guess is that he'll be a starter next year I think that's kind of always been the plan I don't know that that's just a, a, a guess but um knowing that would be you know as part of certainly their offseason strategy too so uh, I would guess yes uh but I don't know that and in part it seemed like they were pretty non-committal towards Buddy at those exit interviews. I shouldn't yeah. say they. It seemed like Kevin Pritchard was. I mean, he talked about how much he loves Buddy and values him and how much Buddy loves basketball and the value of his shooting. But he did kind of call out Buddy by name and say that they challenged him to be better on defense. And in addition to that, talked about, you know, that Buddy needs to be comfortable with the role which led me to believe that they've already decided that they're going to be moving Benedict into the starting lineup because maybe they want to be sure that Buddy's okay coming off the bench full-time next season, or at least that was the way I interpreted it from afar. So my guess is that Benedict does start, and then it goes back to what you said, like one possession that really stands out in my mind. And, you know, it, I would, you know, if, depends what happens with Buddy, but they're playing late against the Utah Jazz. Colin Sexton was calling Tyrese into lots of screens. It was either – get Tyrese up and target at the top of the key with Sexton, or they were trying to get Tyrese in the post against Laurie Markkinen. Um, lots of work for him. And the better matchup that they determined on the screen approach, Buddy pre-switched, pre-switched Tyrese out of the action. So like that's kind of where you're at, where you're feeling more comfortable with Buddy being the on-ball person who's going to get switched into the action rather than Tyrese. And some of that speaks to Tyrese is very good playing off ball and getting his arms in passing lanes and what his instincts are. But also, like, that's who's getting pre-switched, and then Matherin is the low man in that situation. And, like, then you're trusting Matherin to be, you know, 
playing in tall grass and knowing when he should pounce to the roller and when he should stay back to the shooter. And it was just, just looking at it in that moment, it's like, this is a nine one one call. Like you're going to have to hope for a lot of development here for this to be feasible. And, and who else is on the floor, I think is, is valid in that situation and what else they figure out at the four spot. But um, they did win the minutes with Tyrese and, and Mathern out there. I don't want people to think that I'm ignoring that, but um, the defensive development for both of them is going to be really key. Um, and I did like that they brought up that, you know, some of what they do defensively has to come organically and some of it's also going to have to come from roster changes. But um, did you have anything else that you wanted to bring up about Benedict's season specifically that maybe I didn't touch on with my number or my over under? Okay. Shorthand response is to what you just said. First with Buddy, even beyond what his what role makes sense for him, like, look, just zoom out, like for all of basketball time of, of building a team. You have a 30 something year old who has one year left on his deal. Like you think about the future of that player, even if you want them back. So TBD with him. Um, if I circle back to Matherin, I'm going to say something exceedingly reductive. And I just want you to think, think like respond basically. Like, is it dumb to say that I'm super bullish on his future just because his free throw rate is, is as high as it is? No, no, I mean, absolutely. Because I mean, think about this. Let me, let me let you react to this. How much do you wish that you could combine Benedict Matherin and Andrew Nemhard into one oh. player? Then we have an up with Turbonus of combining players. But I mean, honestly, not because they can't play together. I think Andrew and Benedict can, but like if Andrew had Benedict's rim pressure and ability to draw contact or in vice versa, if Benedict had Andrew's feel and guile and Andrew's defensive, you know, reads that he makes and ability to guard top assignments, like that would have been, that would have been the rookie of the year. I'm pretty confident in that. So, um, yeah, Bene- I think Drew Matherbard it will be uh, <laughs> taking over the league in a few years. Just, like, I know that I know that's reductive and it's not based on anything I've seen or any nuance. It's just like this stat is good. And like some players have a high free throw rate because they just never shoot the ball. Right. Like, I think <laughs> I'm going to look while I'm talking. I'm pretty sure O'Shea Brissett finished top 20 in the NBA in free throw rate because he just like never took shots from the field, which like is not reflective of the player O'Shea Brissett is. Um, but obviously Matherin, Matherin finished 13th, right? Like I had a bank. The guys right behind him is Bancaro, Gafford, Sabonis, Dame, Trey Young, like a great group. O'Shea Brissett finished 23rd in free throw rate, I should say. Like he takes a lot of shots and gets to the line a lot. Like to me, that free throw rate means his floor is, is automatically pretty dang good. But ironing out all the stuff that will make him better as a defender and make him fit better with the, the, the setter of the identity of the Pacers and their current franchise player, Tyrese Halliburton are the next steps for him and kind of how I'll define his next season to me. Right. And some of that was kind of the discussion, like not to bring up or pick at old wounds, but like Victor Oladipo, like Victor's shot was very good in his first season, but his shots never been super consistent, but he never got to the line in the way that Benedict does. So that on an off shooting night, he couldn't completely weather that. I don't really remember since the time when I've been covering the team over the last 10 years, somebody that's been able to draw contact and get to the line as consistently as Benedict can. I mean, how many free throws did he have in that last game against the Knicks? I mean, some of it is because of what I said. One of his best skills in transition is his ability to alter his stride length, get his defender off balance, and then drag his toe. That's why he's, like, so good at drawing contact in those situations. But, I I mean, what did he have, like, 12 or 13 free throw attempts? 13. In, yeah, 13. against the Knicks. Like, that's – that's a very ridiculous amount, but yeah, I mean, I think overall, when I look, I mean, we'll do an entire Andrew Nemhart episode and a Benedict one. I tend to think that Benedict has the higher ceiling night to night and Andrew has the more reliable floor because of what he does defensively. But like you said, like it is, it is refreshing to have somebody on the Pacers roster after years of watching them be like in the bottom five of three point attempt rate and free throw attempt rate to know that like, yeah, that guy's going to be able to, not only get himself there to weather the threes, but also potentially get other opposing guys into foul trouble. Like that's an underrated element of this too. They like, he can go at somebody if you know that. And that was something that the Pacers kind of picked on whenever they won that game over the Bucks. not because Benedict was out there, but like Giannis was in foul trouble and they were willing to try to get him into further foul trouble. So when you have a guy like Benedict out there, that's something you can go to. Yeah, like I know we we spent the first 35 minutes just being like he was good at this, but then this, but also this. And like, you know, that nuance is important for every player ever. But at the same time with him, like at some point I just shrug and go, he's so good at this thing that is so hard to do that. I'm like, yep, he's going to be just fine. You know, he's going to be a good player still. And that's kind of where I think 
the next season will be for me for him is if he's kind of the same guy, I can still get to the line like, great, that's a good player. But if you can add a lot of that little stuff that makes him a connecting piece and a great fit with Halberton, then our, our next season reviews of him will be like, hey, this guy's awesome. Yeah, and that's the thing, right? Because like in that final game, I was pointing at like, well, that needs to get better and this needs to get better. And then you'd look at the box score and it's like, oh, he has 19 points at halftime. Like, because <laughs> that's just what he does. Like, he's just that natural of a scorer. So that's a pretty good base to start with, I think, with him. Agreed. Uh, that is, I think, everything I had on him because this was not my player for this. So uh, your turn again, if you have anything else, if not, plug your Patreon, plug your Twitter, all the good stuff. Right. So now everybody's listened to episode two. I hope that you guys are actually liking this and not sick of seeing me on Tony's YouTube channel yet because I'm still <laughs> going to be around a while longer. Um, my handle is at C2 underscore Cooper. If you're listening to this in the podcast form, if you go there, you'll be able to find the link to my Patreon, patreon.com slash basketball. She wrote and this video, I will also embed it over there. And then you'll be able to look at the clips that we mentioned and see the numbers. I have a comment section. If people want to leave comments and tell me how wrong I am, I'm totally open to that. Um, you can leave your comments and thoughts about Benedict and I'll also link I actually wrote an article kind of reviewing Benedict's season already and what I had seen from him as a starter called Evaluating Benedict Mathern in the Present Future. So I'll link that in there too. And if people want to go back and read that, they can do that as well. I think if I wrote that story, my headline would have been Benedict Matherin is good and it would have been a not great story. Uh, it was fantastic. <laughs> I highly recommend you read it. Next week, Kale and I will do two more of these days, TBD, because whoops, on planning, but hey, they'll be fun. Um, Miles Turner and the backup guards will be our topics for next week, so it should be fun. Hope everybody enjoyed today's episode and has a fantastic weekend. See you soon. <laughs>